Hi, everybody. Welcome to the August 23rd, 2019 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on a new poll conducted by Emerson College that found how Colorado registered Democrats rank the current Democratic presidential primary candidates. In first place, with 26% of the vote, is Senator Bernie Sanders, followed by Vice President Joe Biden with 25%, and Senator Elizabeth Warren with 20% of the votes. Senator Michael Bennett polled at 1%. Uh, articles editor 5280, Natasha Gardner, thank you for joining us in a different seat as <laughs> Patty is in uh, parts of nothing, she's in Montana this week. Uh, polling at 1% doesn't sound too positive. Um, now, if it's nationwide for Michael Bennett, I get it. But this was a Colorado Democratic poll. Were you surprised to see our own senator do so poorly? Well, what it might say is that people like him doing the job that he is currently doing more than anything. Um, otherwise, the poll, I think, was exactly what you'd expect. I mean, Bernie did so well here in 2016. And the interesting thing is his supporters never really stopped. After the election, they just kept going. They were very active in the community. So by the time it became official again, they were ready, ready to ramp up their efforts even more. So not surprised by that number, not surprised by Joe getting the number numbers that he did because it's Joe Biden. Everyone knows his name. Elizabeth Warren, of course, has been gaining steam as well. But I don't think any of this is an indication of who Coloradans might actually vote for when we get closer to actually making that decision. I think it's just an indication of who has the most name recognition right now. David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. As Natasha noted, 2016, Colorado definitely felt the burn. Do you see that same uh, feeling amongst the Democratic voters, at least at this point in the game? Well, sure, with between Biden at 40 at 26 and Warren at 20, that's 46 percent already lined up for the, the far left. And that doesn't include the, the scattered votes for other candidates from the Democratic far left. Uh, I, I think it's a probably fairly reliable poll at Emerson College. Uh, Nate Silver, uh, who runs the 538 website that does a lot of polling analytics, gives Emerson a B plus based on its longstanding track record of quality. So th there's, you could get more accurate, but this, this seems close enough. And I, I think that this is really devastating to Bennett, because if you're some guy in New York or California who likes Bennett, um, you know, do you, it, it, if, if you can't even, you're not even in the top three in your own state. You're 1% in your own state. You're not even cracking 5%. Um, th that really looks bad for him. Eric Sonderman, political analyst, this is exactly our game. Did you expect Michael Bennett to do better in his own state? I would have expected him to do somewhat better in his own state, but he has bigger worries right now. His worry is not about the Colorado primary next March. His worry is about the debate uh, in Houston two or three weeks from now and how to qualify for that, and it looks like he probably, he probably won't. I'll agree with one piece of each, Natasha and David. Uh, on, on, on David's piece, yes, you have nearly 50% of the vote for the two most prominent, at least at this point in time, for the two most prominent progressive hard left candidates in the race. Probably says something about where Colorado Democrats are right now. And to Natasha's point, I'm not sure any of this is terribly meaningful in late August when the first voter in Iowa, the first voter in New Hampshire hasn't been heard from. By the time you get to the Colorado primary, this is going to be a momentum play. It's going to be who comes out of Iowa, who comes out of New Hampshire, who comes out of South Carolina, Nevada, et cetera. And it would be down to a, a small handful of candidates, and it will be who has the momentum and who's still alive at that point. Breaking news editor Noel Phillips from the Denver Post joins us. It's great to have you back, Noel. Thank you. Uh, Noel, where does Bennett go from here? He's, uh, he's probably not going to be in the next debate. He's got one percent in his home state. Uh, are these tough times for him right now? Well, Michael Bennett has a job as a U.S. Senator in Colorado. And I joke around and say that running for president's got to be fun, right? You're collecting other people's money to travel the country. People want selfies with you. You eat pork sandwiches at the Iowa State Fair. TV cameras on you. It fills the ego. It's fun. So at some point, he's got to go back and do his job for Colorado in the Senate. But I bet he's having a lot of fun right now. I actually was surprised Hickenlooper dropped when he did because I figured he was having a lot of fun and he doesn't even have a real job. And so, <laughs> like, I, I just imagine that when you're a politician campaigning for presidents, a lot of fun and that ego really gets satisfied. Senator Michael Bennett, what I did on my summer vacation. Man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper officially announced his bid for the U.S. Senate just a week after withdrawing from the Democratic presidential primary. In a video released this week, Hickenlooper said he was not done fighting for the people of Colorado. 
uh, uh, Natasha, sometimes in, in the olden days, back when we were following <laughs> politics, uh, people like uh, Ken Salazar would jump into a Senate race and phew, everybody else was out of the pool. Uh, John Hickler would jump in the pool and everybody said, so what? And actually started to splash him a little bit. Uh, is this going to be a bloody primary? Uh, I think so. And I think that's what's interesting with his timing. I mean, Hickenlooper always takes time and pretty careful decisions about what he does and when he does it. In this case, he waited a week, which gave all of his opponents a lot of time to refine their messages from last week. And last week, the message was that this will not be a coronation. They only got more strong in their opinions in the, than the, the coming days. So what we heard from candidates um, who are also running in the primary are saying that th not only will this not be a coronation, but here are issues that we're going to hit him on. We're going to hit him on the, the environment, in particular his relationship um, with oil and gas companies and his, his record there. Um, also going to hit him on health care and a number of other things. But I think that's what's interesting is Hickenlooper jumps in the race. He takes up a lot of the conversation, but it, it sucks airtime away from all the other candidates. Now 5280 had a chance. We actually sat down and talked to all the other candidates, including Cory Gardner, and had a chance to hear a little bit more about their campaigns. This group of candidates is so incredibly diverse. You have a scientist, you have a clinical scientist, psychologists, you have college professors, you have a lawyer, you have past legislators, you have a current state senator, you have a, just an incredibly diverse group of people who have a lot of different concerns about what's happening in Colorado. And I think that's where Colorado is going to win, because if these people continue to debate the way that they have just started to, and now with Hickenlooper's inclusion, we're just going to end up with a really robust conversation about where Colorado should go. David, does Hickenlooper, should Hickenlooper position himself as the moderate in this primary? Yeah, I, th I think it's hard to change the perce I mean, perception of what you are, and he, he made a big deal of appearing moderate, at least, uh, throughout his political career before, so it would look all the more insincere if he tries something else. Uh, I remember when I was on a, a hiring committee for a, a, a school, and we had two really qualified teachers, liked them, liked them both for the job, and so I brought the issue to the board and said, they're both so good, you know, what, what do you guys think? And one of the board members who was a very successful businessman and founded his own company, he said, what you do is you hire the person who wants the job the most, which we did, and that person worked out great. Here, Hickenlooper has said he doesn't want the job and he wouldn't be good at it. In contrast, you've got, as Natasha said, four uh, past or present state legislators in the race. Two of them achieved high levels of excellence in the job in that they were chosen by their colleagues for leadership positions. Uh, uh, Andrew Romanoff, the former Speaker of the House, and Alice Madden, one of the, the subordinate leaders in the party. The problem with those in the general election is, other than Hickenlooper, most of them are running so far to the left. You know, Romanoff would be such a strong legislator in capability, he's endorsed this Green New Deal to destroy Colorado's economy, and he's also for so-called Medicaid for All, which in fact will be Medicare for All, where you, you wait, you, you get a veterinary standard of care, uh, where the uh, federal government says, well, you know, you're actually better off dead than us paying for your hip replacement now that you're 85 years old, but we can give you some free suicide pills, you know, the, the Canadian model. So I, th I think... Uh, He'd be, he'll be very strong in the primary, but maybe not as strong in the general election. Eric, you wrote a piece for Colorado Politics uh, th that was urging Hickenlooper not to run. Uh, the other side of the voices in, in his ear. Uh, will this be his Waterloo? I don't know if it's his Waterloo. I'm shocked, amazed that he did not take my advice. I'm shocked that <laughs> Chuck Schumer and all the other powers that be in Washington were more persuasive than than, than yours truly. Uh, the, the, I think he, when he got out of the presidential race, yes, he waited a week to formally get into this race, but he was getting into it. I mean, he teed it up in that video that he exiting the presidential race. It was pretty clear what was happening. I guess I really have two main points of concern that I expressed in my column that ran a week ago. Uh, number one is, and David referenced it, is, is he suited to this job? Is it really, you know, yeah, but you can go to Washington and you can show up and you can vote and all the rest, but is it his sweet spot? And he had been on record so many times as saying this really wasn't his aptitude. Not only wouldn't he be terribly good at it, he didn't want to do it. Now he's spinning that very, you know, good spin of we have a duty in this time of crisis and it's not time to leave the playing field and all the rest. But I think the question remains of 
is this really what John Hickenlooper is cut out to do? And then the second point, and both David and Natasha referenced it, is there is a robust and I would argue highly talented field of Democrats who have been in this race for six months, eight months, nine months, whatever it's been, while John Hickenlooper has been off traipsing around Iowa, New Hampshire, and a zillion other places. More power to John Hickenlooper for that quest. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. But it just strikes me as a little bit questionable to give that up and then come airdrop or parachute into this race when there is a lot of young talent. And this is a party that needs, it needs young talent at the national level. Uh, when you know the front runner is Joe Biden, when the Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi, all capable people. But when you have an opportunity as the Democrats are presenting it this year. And Cory Gardner's vulnerable to any of these people. Yeah, Hickenlooper could beat Cory Gardner and probably will, but a lot of these others could beat Cory Gardner as well. Noel, uh, Hickenlooper jumps in, none of his opponents were scared. Uh, should they be? This is still a guy who has yet to lose a race in Colorado. Uh, yeah, name recognition matters. I remember when I was a teenager, Nashville, Tennessee, the city council is almost the size of a mini legislature and um, you got to vote for like seven at-large candidates and I maybe recognized five and there was an Elvis impersonator that ran and I voted for him because I at least recognized Elvis Aaron Presley on the ballot. <laughs> um, so who, yeah, I think actually name recognition goes a long way when people feel obligated to vote and maybe haven't, um, know they want to vote Democratic, haven't really studied up on it and like, I know that guy. So, yeah, I'd be scared. Um, but if you read the satirical website, The Onion, they've had a lot of fun at Hickenlooper's <laughs> expense. His next move will be Jefferson County Commission. They had an article this week, struggling Hickenlooper drops out of Colorado Senate race to run for Jefferson County Commission on the $2.30 he has left over from his Senate campaign. That was hilarious. Yeah, he has at least been very <laughs> successful inspiring The Onion and Stephen Colbert. So yes. he's got that going for him, yes. which is nice. A decision of the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled this week in favor of Colorado Michael Baca. As a presidential elector in Colorado, he was required by state statute to vote for the winner of the popular vote in Colorado in 2016, Hillary Clinton. When he voted instead for John Kasich, the Secretary of State removed him and replaced him with an alternate elector. The appeals court decision found that to be unconstitutional. David, you are our esteemed lawyer at the table. What's the legal angle of all this that we need to know, that, which is more profound than just what happens to Michael Baca? Well, the Independence Institute filed an amicus brief in this case, which uh, was on Michael Baca's side, discussing the original meaning of Article II of the Constitution, which sets up the Electoral College, and then the 12th Amendment from the early 1800s, which, which modified the Electoral College. And as the Tenth Circuit recognized, the text and the original meaning are, are all very clear that the electors in the electoral college are choosers. That, that's what an elector means by all the dictionaries of the time and by all the congressional commentary and, and everything else on it. They have, the states have complete power in how an elector is chosen, but then once the elector is chosen, then the elector has, has free choice him or, or herself, and that, that's just what the, the law neutrally interpreted says. It sets up a conflict between a similar case in which we filed an amicus brief in Washington State where a, uh, the Washington Supreme Court ruled eight to one uh, against the original meaning, partly by instead of using dictionaries from the time, using a modern dictionary. Um, and hopefully this will, the Colorado and Washington cases will get consolidated together or joined and uh, go to the U.S. Supreme Court because as uh, Secretary of State Griswold and her predecessor, Secretary of State Williams, all agree, everybody on all sides agrees, this is an issue that should be resolved by the Supreme Court with finality before it comes up in, in a way that could actually alter the outcome of a presidential election. Let's at least have the rules set in advance rather than in the middle of some conflict where it might uh, affect the result. Eric, it sounds like becoming an elector for the Electoral College in Colorado, which seemed, seemingly was something barely mentioned on your LinkedIn page, now seems pretty cool. Uh, what do you think? I, I'll leave the legal analysis to David, and I think he's right, and I suspect uh, the, uh, the circuit, uh, the Tenth Circuit, got it right here. From a politically pragmatic point of view, 
I think this is troubling. I mean, it, we're about to have a big debate in uh, a year from now in the lead up to the 2020 election about the Electoral College, given that the National Popular Vote Compact is going to be the repeal of, of what the Colorado legislature did is going to be on the ballot a year from now. If uh, I think if you go back into history books, yes, the purpose of electors was exactly what David enunciated and what the Tenth Circuit enunciated. I think in this day and age, it is hard enough to defend the Electoral College, an institution that I think still has value. But if all of a sudden you're going to make electors total free agents, that gets increasingly tricky to explain and increasingly uh, tricky to defend. Now, what Michael Baca did was of no consequence because he was a Hillary Clinton elector, and obviously Hillary Clinton didn't have enough electoral votes to win the Electoral College. This was a protest vote. He was trying to send a signal to Republican electors in other states that they could, they, they could move away from their candidate. But if you s saw this in a way that really tipped a presidential election or threatened to tip a presidential election, I think it gets very, very quickly, tricky very, very quickly. Noel, it, it feels like we're about to learn a lot more about the Electoral College this year and the next year. What do you think? Absolutely. I'm, I went back and brushed up on high school civics, like, what? Um, <laughs> just to make sure I was understanding. I think right now the Electoral College is the system that we have. It's you know, part of the whole U.S. voting system, you allow people like Colorado voted for Hillary Clinton, Clinton but I'm going to go in and vote my own way. Protest vote or not sets a dangerous precedent. What if big money in politics comes in and buys off the electoral delegates? And then the little guy's vote means even less. Um, I just think this is, like, right now this is the system we have, and, like, yeah, it's kind of scary thinking that, People could go rogue and vote en masse and completely upend a popular election in their state and vote the opposite of the people. Natasha, we're likely going to be voting on the National Popular Vote Act that the legislature mm -hmm. acted a part, uh, on our behalf uh, this uh, last session. This sounds like it's going to impact that vote. I know we're getting to a lot of uh, schoolhouse rock stuff here, but it's it's some pretty deep stuff. Do you think we're going to be seeing some effect of what what people's opinions in electoral college that may not have even had any opinions just six months ago? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I will agree with the sentiment that I wish I would have paid attention uh, better. Like maybe I have a time machine to go back to that civics class and, and find out what happened there, because I'm certainly learning more about it as an adult. But I think that in, this feels like breaking news, and it is, but it's been a slow build. Every election cycle that we've had in recent history brings up this question of the Electoral College and its role in our in our um, democracy. And it's an important one, but I don't think it's one that we're going to solve just in this case. And I think there's a bigger question of uh, the just the Electoral College as it is. Is that something that we want? Or are we finding Band-Aid solutions around it, whether that's a national popular vote or whether that's um, what happened in, in this situation? And that conversation I don't think is going to be completed by 2020, but I think 2020 will continue that conversation in ways that we perhaps can't even predict at this table. <laughs> You're saying 2020 is going to be unpredictable? <laughs> Again, with your crazy optimism. Well. <laughs> the Stapleton MCA announced this week that residents of the neighborhood voted to keep the neighborhood's controversial name. About 35% of the residents of the neighborhood participated in the election, with 65% of the voters seeking to keep the name. Uh, Eric, were you surprised by these results in the Stapleton neighborhood? I was somewhat surprised, particularly by the margin. I mean, this was a two-to-one race in a very liberal neighborhood of Denver, not terribly integrated, but, uh, uh, but very, very liberal. I'd say the woke quotient, if you can use that phrase, is pretty high in a place like Stapleton. Uh, I think it is probably a reaction to some of the excesses of this whole woke movement uh, over the last few years in terms of getting rid of statues and whatever. There has to be at some point an ethic of you judge people by the, in the context of the times in which they live. No one is, no historical figure will look nearly that good in a modern context. That said, I thought Wellington Webb uh, had a, a thoughtful op-ed on this a few weeks ago. And it's one thing, you know, to be, tearing down murals of George Washington in a San Francisco high school. That's crazy. Benjamin Stapleton was not that long ago. I mean, he was a century ago, so that's a substantial period of time. But, um, but we're not talking three centuries ago. 
And uh, I mean, he actively, he, he was not tacitly part of the Klan. He actively was a part of the Klan. He brought the Klan into Denver City Hall. Uh, he, he made the Klan a part of city government. He beat a recall election by activating the Klan. Uh, he's a particularly reprehensible figure in Denver and Colorado history. Now, I, lastly, I suggest that most people who live in Stapleton, when they are asked where they live, they're not thinking of Benjamin Stapleton. They're just thinking of the name of a neighborhood and an old airport. Uh, Noel, is this issue, uh, d does this vote rest the issue or heat it up? No, it doesn't rest it. Um, this country continues to struggle with racism. It's a scar and a stain on our country. Um, as a people, we should have no tolerance for it and confess up to our um, racist legacy that's still in existence and impacts every aspect of life in the United States. Um, and th it's not unprecedented for Denver neighborhoods to eventually change their names. In April, Swastika Acres was a subdivision in Cherry Hills Village. They took a neighborhood vote and their name is now Old Cherry Hills. So it's not unprecedented and it may take some time to gain momentum. This isn't over. Natasha, what do you think? Uh, 5280 writes a lot about uh, Denver issues. I'm sure it's written about this one. Were you surprised by the results? I don't think so, but I do think it is part of an ongoing conversation. I don't think that it's a conversation that's finished. I mean, human beings for as long as probably recorded history have felt the need to name things after other human beings. And every groundbreaking and ribbon cutting that I've been to in recent memory, that case pretty much hold, uh, holds true. So until we change that, I think we will continually have this problem. Um, and it is an important discussion to have, um, whether it is 2019, maybe it's something that should have happened in 2000, 1990, I mean, go back as far as you want. These are questions that we, we should continue to have. And, and you know, just as uh, on a lighter side of things, Stapleton has just had a couple of weird weeks between the prairie dogs with the plague, the fish concert can't have camping on the grounds anymore, and then the air mattresses that were flipping through the neighborhood. Um, this is a little bit more serious, as is appropriate, but it's just been an odd news cycle for that neighborhood. Indeed. Uh, David, wrap it up for us. What do you think? Back in uh, when Stalin was running the, the Soviet Union and people had the official Soviet encyclopedia, they would from time to time get instructions. Uh, we got this encyclopedia page which has a cover of an esteemed a picture of an esteemed party member who's now in the gulag so here is a replacement page cut out the page with him and put the new one in and we'll pretend he never existed and I think the country the people of the Stapleton neighborhood in this country of a whole are, are just kind of sick of this if you have to go back and obliterate um, everything from the past let's get to our very favorite part of the show Natasha, it is your turn to kick off Disgrace of the Week. Well, in any given week, there can be so many, and they dominate the headlines, but something that has unfortunately fallen below the fold this week is that the rainforest is burning, and that should be headlining news any day. David. The most single irresponsible act in the uh, first term of uh, Governor Polis so far, uh, calling for the Attorney General to investigate a police shooting of a fle fleeing, uh, violent, armed felon. Uh, which is allowed under not only for self-defense but simply to prevent the escape of it's always been lawful to prevent the escape of a fleeing felon it's being investigated by the district attorney of the area and uh, by a different law enforcement agency in this case the Colorado uh, the uh, El Paso County Sheriff's as the Colorado statute requires and when if there's ever some there are occasionally situations where one DA will say I'm, I'm, I'm too close to the situation I don't want to do it so they'll hand it off to a DA in a different area. The Attorney General is not equipped to do it, and it's uh, really sad to see Governor Polis uh, support this kind of uh, divisive demagoguery uh, against the police and uh, inflaming racial tensions by uh, going along with, with this uh, improper request. Eric. I'll have something to say about what David just said, but I'll save that for my say something nice. Uh, how about just in terms of breaking news as we tape this at noon, uh, a Donald Trump tweet this morning Basically, I don't have the exact transcript in front of me, but asking the question of who was more, patri who was more patriotic, J Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, to the United States, or President Xi of China. Obviously, Trump is in a war with the head of the Federal Reserve. Let them fight it out. But this just shows a complete lack of decency and perspective on the part of our president 
to compare the patriotic head of a long-term U.S. institution with the head of the Communist Party of China. Noel. Yeah, this week, um, the Mauer, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Mauer Enterprise in Eastern Oregon made headlines when there was a criminal investigation into reporters at that newspaper who were calling um, public employees um, after hours and sending them lots of emails. Uh, that's a disgrace. They never should have been the subject of a criminal investigation for doing the job of a free press in the United States. And public officials have a duty to respond to the public, including the reporters. And um, it's intimidation of the press. It was awful. Ultimately, the sheriff rightfully determined that the reporters did nothing wrong. Time to say something nice rather quickly. Natasha. Colorado has a great history of bicycle races, but this week there's a new chapter with the Colorado Classic, and it features some of the best female riders around the country and around the world. David. The Denver City Council did the right thing by voting not to confiscate Tom's diner, um, there, which would have deprived a hardworking uh, man of, of his life's investment and savings. Eric. Yes to what David just said. No to what David said on the previous round. I give a shout out. To Governor Polis, I thought his call, uh, I'll disagree with David on this one, his call for an independent investigation for some other jurisdiction to get involved in the shooting of Devon Bailey. I know we're on time here, but I thought it was responsible. We're not, he's not asking for the guy, to, the cops to be indicted. He's just asking for another second look. Noel. This one's personal. My husband and I just bought a house in Arvada, and um, it was an unusual home buying process. We actually met the sellers on multiple occasions, uh, Lynn and Karen Robinson. They're like the sweetest people ever. I wish everybody <laughs> in the United States could be like them, and they're like just great. So I wanted to give them a shout out for like inviting us to the block party in July when we were still under contract and getting <laughs> introducing us to everybody in the neighborhood. It's great. Well, speaking of sweet people, great segue from Noel. Uh, this is the last show for our producer, Chelsea Hernandez. She wasn't here very long, but when she was here, she was fantastic. She's off to a whole new opportunity. We're very excited for her. We're sad to see her go, but we're happy for this new chapter of her career. So good luck, Chelsea. Thank you for all the great work you've done for us so far here at Colorado Inside Out. That is all time we have this episode of Colorado Inside Out. For everybody here at CPT12, I'm Dominic Nizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. Mm -hmm.